Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a new series of videos today on the classic textbook, An Introduction to Greek by Crosby and Schaefer. This is a book which you can actually download yourself for free from archive.org. I've provided the link in the video description um, since this was first released nearly 100 years ago, 1928, 96 years ago, and is an excellent source for learning Attic Greek, um, or the kind of Greek you would need to study Plato and Aristotle. So this is the kind of Greek which is particularly useful for, um, I think, uh, people following this channel who are interested in philosophy. Um, we will try to cover the other varieties of Greek in the future, such as um, the later Koine Greek you'd use to read the New Testament, or the earlier Homeric Greek you would um, use to read, say, the Iliad, and in addition to those two, we have Byzantine Greek of the Middle Ages and then Modern Greek, which is spoken today. We're going to be learning um, Attic Greek because, uh, once again, we're interested in philosophy, but I'm also particularly um, fond of this textbook because um, it has a number of brief um, lessons which are um, going to be covered on this channel one by one, starting today with um, the intro and first lesson that covered the alphabet and declension of O stems. Uh, but there's also a lot of really good practice with regard to um, translating from Greek to English or vice versa, and that is why I think this is a really good place to start. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts are in the video description. Now, we'll begin with the uh, Greek alphabet, um, which, um, interestingly, is explicated in this textbook through examples which we have in English that are often actually just taken from the Greek words themselves, which makes it particularly um, uh, easy to remember how these are to be pronounced. So, we have uh, the first um, letter of the Greek alphabet, which is quite fittingly alpha, and the sound from... English, which we use to remember how this is to be pronounced, given that there are several different A sounds within English. You know, there's A like an ant, and then there's A like in drama, which is actually, you see, taken from the Greek itself. You can see the, the Greek word written on that furthest right column. Well, um, this is the kind of A sound which we're going to keep in mind as we begin pronouncing the text, much like in uh, the second letter, beta, um, the uh, word which will help us to remember how this is pronounced is Bible, which is, of course, taken from Greek itself, the word for a book, biblion. Next we have gamma, uh, which um, we can remember how that's pronounced through the word ganglion. Then we have delta, which we can remember how that is pronounced um, through the English word decalogue, which is itself taken from oh, the Greek word we see on the furthest right column, Deca. Then we have epsilon, and the word we um, use to remember this is epic. Then we have zeta, and the word we have to remember is ads. Then we have eta, which um, we remember through the word ze. Then we have theta, which we remember through the word atheist. Then we have yoda. This is not, by the way, iota, as we um, tend to transliterate that into modern English. Oh, not an iota of this or that was missed. No, it's actually yota, as I recall. Um, so the uh, word we um, have to remember this is intrigue. Then we have kappa, which uh, we remember through the word crisis. Next we have lambda, which we remember through the word logic taken from, of course, the Greek word logos, meaning word, reason, fire, depending on which philosophy you're reading, might have various uh, meanings, but you can see we're already learning the philosophical vocabulary we'll need moving forward. Next we have the letter mu, which we remember through meter. Next we have the Greek letter nu, which we remember through the word anti. Then we have a uh, she, which we remember through axiom. It was funny that uh, she precedes omicron, with the Greek alphabet, but uh, when there was a new variant of a certain disease we were not allowed to mention, they skipped she because they didn't want people um, associating uh, the Wuhan virus with uh, the leader of the country it came from. So be that as it may, we're skipping now also to Omicron. Remember this through the uh, English word obey. And we have pi, which we remember through the English word poet. Poesis in Greek is... A general kind of making, but for 
uh, Aristotle, for example, um, the highest kind of productive science is the kind that creates a poetry in the more restric restricted sense of, say, the works of Homer. Uh, pretty things made of words is not the only kind of making or production humans can do, but it is the highest. That's how we get the word poetry within modern English. Then we have the letter rho, which we remember through the word katar. Then we have sigma, which we remember through the word spore. Tau, we remember through the word toad. Upsilon, we remember through a French u. So, it, much like in French, uh, j'ai vu, déjà vu, that's that sort of u. Then we have a, a phi, which we remember through Philip. Uh, chi, which we remember through character. Psi, which we remember through words like apps. Then we have omega, the final letter. We have the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. This we know through the word ocean. We also have some diphthongs, which represent the union of two vowels in one syllable. Now we will go through these diphthongs quickly. Uh, they actually sound about the way you would expect them to sound, um, similar to the diphthongs within English. That first one is I, like in aisle. The second is A, like in freight. Um, the next is oi as in toil. The next is we, or maybe you might compare that to the word for yes within French. Uh, the next is owl, like in cow. The next is um, we might represent it as the combination a and u. Um, the next is also a and u, but a slightly different a. And then we have um, u as in group. And move on to the first lesson, which deals with the declension of O stems. It starts with a quote from Greek, which you might be familiar with. En arche en o logos. When the beginning was the word. And we'll be able to read that in Greek by the end of today's lesson. Now, declension um, within classical languages largely refers to the system of changes or adjustments which can be applied to say a noun in order to reflect its role within the sentence through a change of case rather than simply rely on word order. Now, to understand what that really means, we have to speak briefly about the difference between what are called analytic languages and synthetic languages. Now, English, at least modern English, the kind spoken today, is um, a great example of an analytic language because there's actually very little change to the form of words um, because that is um, not necessary to show you whether the word is being used as a subject or a direct object or an indirect object, etc. Because within modern American English, um, that information is largely supplied through the uh, word's position within the order of the sentence. And this is something which we can see through um, the uh, humorous example of talking about a man eating chicken. Now, when I phrase it that way, it's ambiguous because I'm not sure whether I'm talking about a man-eating chicken in the sense of a giant bird which is chasing the poor fellow you see on the bottom half of that screen. That could be considered a man-eating chicken, or um, whether I'm talking about the image on the top half of the screen, which is a man, like a food ranger there, the famous vlogger from Canada, um, eating chicken from a street food stall somewhere in Mexico, as one episode of his uh, channel had covered. And the reason this is unclear is because in that sort of ING form, um, it's making ex uh, implicit reference to, we could say, some other phrase in which um, the role of subject and object would be clearly distinguished uh, through placing one of these nouns before the verb and another after. So you may notice that if I'm referring to the top image with Food Ranger, I would um, write that um, as an actual sentence as the man ate the chicken. But if I was talking about the second image there, I would reverse the order. I would say the chicken ate the man. Interestingly, the nouns themselves look exactly the same in both cases. There's actually no change whatsoever to the form of the noun when it becomes the object rather than subject of the sentence. In both cases, we have man and we have chicken. It's just the uh, word's position relative to that conjugated verb ate, which tells us 
what its role is within the sentence. If it's before, once again, it's typically the subject. If it's after the verb, it's typically the object. Now, this is something of an anomaly, I would argue, with regard to the way things had been done within Indo-European languages, especially the ancient Indo-European languages like Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, etc. had very rich case systems and um, uh, typically had endings added on to uh, the noun stem itself to tell you, regardless of word order, whether that word was being used as, say, the subject or the direct object, the indirect object, etc. And we could examine a case from Latin which could illustrate how this works. If we have puer as um, the word for a boy as subject, if we have puellae with that i ending to uh, designate the girl as the indirect object of, say, an act of giving, then we have rosam as um, the object and dot as the conjugated verb gives, um, we could have all three of the following word orders be perfectly valid to say the same thing. We could say puer, puella, rosam, dot. For the boy gives the rose to the girl. But we could also put the girl at the front of the sentence. Puella, rosam, dot, puer. It still means the same thing, despite having a very different word order than we would expect within English. So, too, we could put the rose at the front. Rosam, dot, puer, puella. Now, there is certainly a tendency within Latin to favor, say, a word order in which the conjugated verb comes at the end of the sentence, but it's not a strict rule. It will still be understood in a way that would not be the case in English if I said, the man, the chicken, Eight. Typically, that will not be understood because we're so reliant on word orders. So if we now move on to consider how this would work within Attic Greek itself, we find that there's actually not only one right answer for which endings should be tacked onto the end of the noun stem to show us whether a word is being used as the subject or direct object or indirect object etc. There's actually several different such systems, and the first one we're going to learn are uh, um, the ones dealing with the nouns of the o declension whose nominatives end in os and are usually masculine. A great example of such a word provided by the book itself is o potamos, which is actually quite familiar to us from words like hippopotamus. If you've ever wondered what a hippopotamus is within English, that's just a transliteration of a river horse. Now, the um, order of the cases within this Greek paradigm will be a little different than if you've studied, say, a language like German, in which in German it's typically nominative, accusative, etc. Here we're going to actually go nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. We're only going to concern ourselves with singular and plural, um, for the dual within Greek is more like something we study in a Homeric Greek textbook. Here we're just going to concern ourselves with singular and plural. Now, you'll notice that there's a determinant, a determiner, or an article, if you will, um, before the word for the river, which also changes its form um, to show the case of the word it is modifying. So it's not only the noun itself, which you have to understand how it's changing. You also have to pay attention to the way that its modifiers, such as this determiner or article, is also undergoing a certain morphological change to communicate the grammatical information about its role within the sentence. So if we consider the nominative as basically the subject of the verb, we have o potamos, which uh, we could compare to the Latin ending us as provided by the book itself to see how uh, clear it is that Greek and Latin had a common ancestor in Proto-Indo-European. A lot of similarities here. And also, we'll consider on the next slide also how um, it would look in Sanskrit. But before we get to that, we'll examine the genitive singular. Here we have tu potamu comparable to the Latin ending e. And we have the dative singular, to potamo, comparable to the long o within Latin. Next we have the accusative singular, ton potamon, comparable to the Latin um and the Sanskrit naram for the singular accusative. And we move on to the plural nominative, oi potamoi, 
comparable to the long e within Latin. And we have the genitive plural ton potamon, comparable to the orum form within Latin. The plural dative is tois potamois, comparable to the is form within Latin. And then the uh, plural accusative tus potamus, comparable to the os form within Latin. Now, if we just very quickly take a look at the paradigm for masculine nouns within Sanskrit, we can see some similarities. Now, obviously, there's a lot more cases within Sanskrit. We have an instrumental case, an ablative case, a locative case, a vocative case. Uh, we're just going to concern ourselves with four within Attic Greek. If we compare those, we have nara for nominative singular, naram for accusative singular, naraya for dative singular narasya for genitive singular and it shows just how fascinating it would be to study these languages together learning sanskrit latin and greek a lot of similarities are going to emerge in surprising places because they're all ancient indo-european languages but we will return now to attic greek to consider the textbook's own examples of how these would be used now before we do that i want you to actually take a notebook and physically copy down these paradigms so it will become second nature to recognize them when they are used because of the kind of connections which are formed through the act of actually writing something physically with a pencil in your hand interesting fact that um, despite the fact that um, we maybe no longer really need to write things down by hand because of the use of computers etc there's still something about that that helps you remember it in your brain more than if you were to just run your eyes over the text within a book or on a computer screen so even though it might seem quote-unquote technologically uh, redundant or obsolete to still be writing this in a notebook, I, th I would argue that you really need to do that if you're serious about learning this. So once again, go ahead and write this paradigm in a physical notebook, write it out a few different times, and then make reference to it as we try our first um, exercises in today's class. But before we do that, we're going to see the textbook's own examples of how these might be used. The nominative uh, once again, is the case for the subject, but I would argue in addition to that for the subject complement. The interesting thing about the kinds of verbs which are copulae, like um, the verb to be within English, is that it's not really describing an action. Rather, the copula allows you to say that two different symbols refer to the same thing. It's like the equal sign within mathematics. Within mathematics, if I say 2 plus 3 equals 5, equals does not tell me about an operation which is actually performed on the operands. Rather, it tells me that 2 plus 3 and 5 might look like different symbols, but they refer to exactly the same location on the number line. So too, within language. In the example, ois trote goi esan Adelfoi, um, the generals were brothers. Here, generals and brothers are two different symbols referring to the same people. And that's why both of them have the same case endings. In both cases, we see oi. And oh, by the way, we also see oi as the determiner before the word for general. By the way, strategy, if you're wondering, um, is just the thing that generals do because we get that from the Greek word for a general. And I'll move on to the genitive, which... Um, it tells us really um, that one thing is possessed by another. We might translate this with the prepositional uh, phrase in English, uh, starting with the preposition of, for example, the brother of the general in this example. But we could also use the properly inflected genitive form within English. Uh, basically, the only inflection still uh, performed on nouns rather than pronouns within English is that genitive, as we could um, talk about the brother of the general, or we could just talk about the general's brother. Either one of those are valid, but um, within Greek, you may have noticed something very interesting here, um, in which we have two different determiners um, following one after the other. We have two different articles, two different thes, because they're in two different cases. So there's something of a nesting structure here, in which tu um, stratego is um, nested within this uh, broader um, phrase, o adelphos, to show that um, here, uh, generals is just modifying that other noun which is the main noun we can see that's in the nominative case so it's just a modifier of adelphos 
And we have the dative case, which suggests, if you will, indirect object relations, which would typically be translated within English through prepositional phrases headed by the prepositions to, for, etc. For example, if you're sending something to someone, you have two different objects there. One is the direct object, which the thing that you're sending, and the other is the indirect object, the person you're sending it to. An example from the book, to, um, stratego, pempeton, adelfon. He sends his brother to the general. In this case, um, stratego or general is dative, and adelfon with that in at the end is accusative, which leads us to our last example. Um, the accusative being the direct object of a transitive verb. A transitive verb is a verb that transitively passes an action onto its direct object. We keep in mind that trans just means across in Latin. So that action is going across from the subject to its direct object. Here, um, he's sending his brother. So Adelfon Pempe. You notice in that example, there's no um, explicit subject. We do not see the pronoun he because within an inflected or synthetic language like Greek, uh, it's not necessary. It's a redundancy. We don't need the um, subject to be explicitly present uh, to tell that Adelfon is here being used as uh, an object because the on ending already tells us that he's the one being sent rather than the one who's doing the sending. One last point of grammar we will cover before moving on to our exercises and vocabulary is uh, the fact that the article within Greek um, is only ever the definite article, the word the within English translation. There's no indefinite article within Greek. We don't have an explicit word for a or an, so that is often something that you will have to restore within your translation. If we consider their own example, eke, adelfon, uh, that basically just says has brother, but we would restore the words that are not present within Greek explicitly because they're not necessary, but would be necessary within English because, once again, we are an analytic language where we would have to restore he and a to get the sense of what is being talked about here, not just has brother, but he has a brother. So keep that in mind as you are doing your translations. And so we now move on to some vocabulary, which will be necessary also for you to write out by hand. We will be using this um, not only in today's exercise, but many others moving forward will be sort of snowballing an ever larger set of vocabulary, which we'll use over and over again for the rest of this textbook. We'll start today with words which actually should be quite familiar to you. Adelphos is the word for a brother, much like, once again, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love with the highest murder rate in the country, basically. But uh, be that as it may, the um, not-so-humorous irony, we still understand that this is actually a Greek word. Next, we have eke, which is uh, present tense for he, she, or it has. The third-person singular form of that word um, to be contrasted with Ecousi, which is the plural third person, they have. Once again, we may not see the pronoun they or he or she or it because the form of this word you can see is enough to tell you whether it's a third person singular or third person plural. Within English, we would perhaps in some cases not have that restored, a verb that doesn't undergo inflections um, with regard to person like, say, may. He may, they may. See, it's the same. We need the pronoun to tell us not so in Greek. Next, we have another pair of um, uh, conjugated verbs from the uh, third person, singular and plural. These are in, which is he, she, it, um, or there was in the past tense, and ezan, which is they or there were in the past tense. Next, we have the uh, word poe, which is he, she, or it stops. This is a transitive verb, by the way. And we contrast it with poe, uh, pau, uzi, which is they stop. That is a third person uh, plural. Next, we have uh, the verb pempe, which is he, she, or it sends. And then the plural form, pempuzi, which is they send. We know Potamos is the river, and we know that strategos is the general. We get the words hippopotamus and strategy, once again, 
from these in transliteration. So we'll go ahead and now try the first exercise, which is largely just going to test our recognition of case form endings. I want you to pause the tape, write these down, fill out your answers, and then check back in a moment to compare. Okay, so the first one of these is Adelfu, which we recognize as the singular genitive. The next of these is Thrategus, which we recognize as the plural accusative. Next is Potamois, which we recognize as the plural dative with that ois ending. Then we have uh, Potamon, which is the singular accusative. Next we have Adelfoi, which we recognize as the plural nominative with that oi ending. And we have Adelfos, which is of course the singular nominative, maybe default form of the word we're used to learning first. And then we have um, Stratagon, which is the plural genitive. And Stratago, which is the singular dative form. Let's go ahead now and move on to the next exercise in which the book tells us we should read aloud in Greek and then translate into English. Once again, pause your tape, fill in your answers, and check back in a moment to compare. Okay, so the first sentence, in strategos, we would just translate as, um, first, was a general, and since there's nothing else there, the book told us we could translate as this as, there was a general, that's what we'll go ahead and go with, at least in my translation. The next one, eke adelfus. Okay, we can see the us ending there gives us the plural accusative. There is not a explicit subject for the verb ek, which we know is has in the singular, so we just translate this with the restored generic subject he um, as he has brothers in the plural. Next to the third sentence, pousi ton strat. Okay, so we know that um, the uh, verb is plural, and it's somebody in the plural stopping. Um, a singular direct object, which is the general, that on ending on both the determiner and the noun itself tell us that. So we'll just restore generic third person plural subject, um, they stop the general. Pousi ton strategon. And we move on to the fourth sentence. Oi strategoi as an adelfoi. Okay, so we have um, here a um, construction with a subject and a subject complement joined by a copula in the past tense in the third person plural form. And we know that um, this is such a construction because we see oi, oi, and oi for all three of these forms. And we would translate this then as um, the generals were brothers. The fifth sentence we have in potamos. So once again, we have just the past tense um, form of to be. Okay, We have was and we have a um, word in the singular nominative with that os ending. So the book told us we can translate this as not just was river, but there was a river. Notice once again, I had to restore there and I had to restore a uh, because of the difference between an analytic language like modern American English that requires those extra words um, versus an inflected language like Greek in which those are not necessary because the case endings are already telling us everything we need to know. We then move on to the sixth sentence. To stratego pempetus adelfus. We would translate this as he sends his brother to the general, okay? Excuse me, he sends his brothers to the general. We know that um, the ones being sent are plural because we have us and us for both the terminer and the noun, and um, we know that uh, the one receiving these, uh, the indirect object is singular because we see that O ending twice. And we know that the one sending, although there is no explicit subject here, is somebody in the third person singular, so we just generically restore he to fill out the sentence in translation. And we have the seventh sentence. Poe tus strategus. Uh, here we have um, the uh, 
uh, plural accusative uh, direct object uh, because we see us and us. And we know that this is talking about generals that are the ones being stopped. We do not have an explicit subject, so we restore it. Poe tu strategus is he stops the generals. We know, once again, that it's third person singular because um, at the level we're working at right now anyway, we don't see that S sort of um, letter that would be present in the third person plural version of this, which if we refer back to the vocabulary would be pousi. Okay, so we now move on to the eighth and final sentence of this lesson, which is pempuzi ton tu strategu adelfon. So here we have a nesting structure in which we see one determiner followed by another determiner in different cases. This tells us that there are two different nouns, one of which is a mere modifier of another. In this case, we could see that um, tu strategu is in the singular genitive and ton adelfon is in the singular accusative, so we would translate this as the brother of the general or the general's brother. We do not have an explicit subject, but we restore it generically as not he, but they. We know that because we see that S there indicating at the level we're working at right now anyway that this is third person plural. Uh, Pempuzi um, tells us that it is they send, and we would restore this in translation as they send the brother of the general. Okay, I want you now to have your own turn as a student to translate. Go ahead and fill out on a piece of paper yourself um, the answer you think should be required for their challenge for you to complete the following sentence by adding the endings and the accents. Okay, this is something which I'll allow you to just fill out on your own, and we will meet again next time tomorrow for the second lesson, which will continue our discussion of the O, declension of the O stem. So thank you so much. Really enjoying this series so far. Thank you for watching. I look forward to more.